Welcome to MedMastery's Cardiology Digest, where expert insights are unleashed. My name is Peter, and I'm here with my colleague, Nora. We're from MedMastery, and we bring you the latest scientific findings in the field of cardiology and medicine once a week. Keep yourself updated by subscribing now. In today's episode, we'll cover four recent papers. We've got one from JAMA, a national study on transcatheter mitral valve repair in a population that's different from what the approval was initially based upon. We've also got a study from JAMA Cardiology that tried a modified wide area circumferential ablation technique for atrial fibrillation to see if it would yield better results than the usual practice. Next, we have a study detailing a safe and practical approach to anticoagulant management for patients with atrial fibrillation who need to undergo endoscopy, and a paper on the success of a new approach to helping patients with Brugada syndrome. We have all the details on these studies and we can't wait to share them with you. So grab a coffee, adjust your headphones, and get ready to deep dive into these cutting edge research findings. Nora's going to get us off to a running start with that mitral valve repair study. Peter, you bet. This is a fascinating study that explores a procedure known as transcatheter mitral valve edge-to-edge -edge repair for degenerative mitral regurgitation. This research was conducted by Makar and his team and was published in JAMA in May 2023. This National Registry study analyzed data from patients in the United States, showing a strong safety record and an impressive success rate for this particular valve repair procedure. The technique, which uses a device called a MitraClip, has been approved by the FDA for patients considered high risk for surgery. However, this study found that the population benefiting from this therapy is much more extensive than initially thought, extending beyond the high-risk patients seen in clinical trials. This research includes outcomes for 19,088 patients who received this procedure between 2014 and 2022. Regarding patient demographics, the median age was 82 years and almost half, 48%, were women. The 30-day mortality median predicted risk was 4.6%. With regard to surgical risk, 22% were classified as high surgical risk, 68% were classified as medium surgical risk, and 10% fell into the low surgical risk category. When looking at the rate of success, defined as mitral regurgitation being reduced to moderate or less, and a gradient of less than 10 millimeters of mercury, the success rate was impressive, approximately 90%. What's even more impressive is that for those with a successful repair, approximately half experienced only mild mitral regurgitation and a gradient less than 5 millimeters of mercury. Complications at 30 days were low with death, stroke, and the need for mitral valve reintervention all at 3% or less. And the icing on the cake? Successful procedures were associated with a significantly lower mortality rate at one year, 14% compared to 27%, and a substantial drop in heart failure readmission rates, 8% versus 17%. Now, to encapsulate this in one sentence, the study concludes that successful transcatheter mitral valve repair for degenerative mitral regurgitation is linked to lower mortality and decreased rates of hospitalization due to heart failure. Experts commenting on the study emphasized the excellent safety profile of this procedure and its high success rate. They also highlighted the need for ongoing trials comparing this procedure to surgery, especially given the broadening scope of patients for whom this technique is proving beneficial. Now let's shift gears and talk about a safe and practical approach to anticoagulant management for patients with atrial fibrillation who need to undergo endoscopy. Peter, what have you got for us on that? Nora, we're going to learn all about that thanks to a research study conducted by Hansen Barkin and colleagues. It's a prospective clinical study published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology in May 2023, titled Periprocedural Management of Patients with Atrial Fibrillation Receiving a Direct Oral Anticoagulant Undergoing a Digestive Endoscopy. This research forms part of the larger PAUSE study, an ongoing multi-center effort to standardize the handling of direct-acting oral anticoagulants, such as apixaban, dabigatran, or rivaroxaban. However, there have been inconsistencies among guidelines on how best to manage these drugs around the time of procedures, particularly ones involving endoscopy. The focus of this particular analysis was on a subgroup of 556 adult patients with atrial fibrillation who underwent an endoscopy procedure, such as a colonoscopy and or gastroscopy, 
while being treated with direct acting oral anticoagulants. The researchers were interested in understanding the associated risks with temporarily halting the direct acting oral anticoagulants for a short period, just one day before the procedure, and then resuming one day after procedures with a low risk of bleeding, and resuming it two days after for procedures with a high risk of bleeding. The results were intriguing. Of the patients studied, four experienced arterial thromboembolic events, such as an ischemic stroke, systemic embolism, or transient ischemic attack. Importantly, though, only one of these events seemed to be directly linked to the temporary halt of the anticoagulants. The other events occurred 11 to 24 days after the direct-acting oral anticoagulants were resumed. Furthermore, 14 patients experienced gastrointestinal bleeding, and among those, five had major bleeding within 30 days. Despite these occurrences, the overall findings suggest that this standardized approach to pausing and resuming direct-acting oral anticoagulants was linked with low rates of serious complications, both in terms of thromboembolism and major bleeding. In other words, this study offers a straightforward, feasible, and above all, low-risk strategy for managing direct-acting oral anticoagulants in patients with atrial fibrillation who are undergoing endoscopy. What's the expert take on this? Well, they believe that given the brief interruption period and low complication rates for the direct-acting oral anticoagulants used in this PAUSE study, this approach is worth considering for most patients with atrial fibrillation who are due for an endoscopic procedure. So there you have it, a standard, simplified approach to managing anticoagulants around endoscopic procedures could improve patient outcomes and reduce inconsistencies in care. Nora, also on the topic of atrial fibrillation, You've got something that's going to interest our listeners, right? Absolutely, Peter. I want to know if any of our listeners are interested in learning more about how to effectively manage atrial fibrillation patients. If so, MedMastery's Atrial Fibrillation Management Essentials course could be just what you need. All of you know that atrial fibrillation is a common rhythm problem that clinicians encounter all around the world. However, treating it can be a challenge especially when deciding whether to use rhythm control or rate control methods or figuring out what type of anticoagulant will be best for your patient. And if you're considering ablation, you may wonder if your patient is an ideal candidate. That's where this course can help. It will provide you with clarity on the atrial fibrillation guidelines and evidence so that you can treat patients with confidence. So if you're ready to improve your skills and gain more confidence in treating atrial fibrillation patients, Check out MedMastery's Atrial Fibrillation Management Essentials course today. But we're not done talking about atrial fibrillation just yet. Peter, I'm really curious to hear about your next study. I want to know if their modified wide area circumferential ablation technique for atrial fibrillation yielded better results than the usual practice. You bet, Nora. The study was published in March 2023 and is titled Standard versus Augmented Ablation of Paroxysmal Atrial Fibrillation for Reduction of Atrial Fibrillation Recurrence, the AWARE Randomized Clinical Trial. This groundbreaking research was done by Nair and colleagues. Atrial fibrillation is a challenging condition that we continue to strive to manage better. For years, we have been searching for methods to boost the success rate of atrial fibrillation ablation. Although pulmonary vein isolation is the standard procedure, it's been a tough road proving if we can improve outcomes beyond this method, either by isolating all four veins individually or using a wide area circumferential ablation technique. Let's dive into the specifics of this study now. 398 patients, all with the diagnosis of symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, took part in the study. Each one underwent a standard wide area circumferential ablation procedure. Entrance and exit block was documented. Following this, the patients were randomly divided into two groups. One group received an additional wide area circumferential ablation, this time extending outside the initial ablation area, while the second group received no further treatment. Fast forward a year, and 27% of patients who received only the standard single ablation showed a recurrence of atrial tachyrrhythmia, that is, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or atrial tachycardia. Meanwhile, in the group that received the augmented ablation, the recurrence rate was only marginally lower at 25%. Now you might wonder, what about adverse events? Well, the rate stood at 7% for both groups, indicating a similar safety profile. The key takeaway from this study is that while one might argue that there's a slight advantage to a more extensive ablation approach, 
the difference isn't substantial enough to be a game changer. All right, onwards. Now Nora is going to tell us about a fascinating study from Circulation, detailing a new approach to helping patients with Brugada syndrome. For sure, Peter. Let's get into it. This is a study with substantial implications for patients suffering from a rare and alarming condition, Brugada syndrome. The study is titled, Long-Term Outcomes of Brugada Substrate Ablation, a report from Bravo, Brugada Ablation of VF Substrate Ongoing Multicenter Registry, and it's a prospective registry study. This work is the brainchild of Dr. Nadamani and his talented team. Brugada syndrome, although uncommon, poses a terrifying risk of sudden cardiac death. Until recently, patients were primarily treated with the drug quinidine, notorious for its myriad of undesirable side effects, and most of them would get an ICD implanted. However, a glimmer of hope has emerged in the form of epicardial ablation at the right ventricular outflow tract. The research team followed 159 symptomatic patients with Brugada syndrome who had experienced spontaneous ventricular fibrillation. This cohort all demonstrated specific electrogram features indicative of Brugada syndrome, on their right ventricular outflow tract epicardium. Interestingly, a further 30% had an additional arrhythmic substrate located on the inferior right ventricular epicardium. The long-term follow-up was an average of four years after their last ablation treatment. The researchers found that an impressive 81% of patients remained free from recurrences of ventricular fibrillation after only one ablation. Even more encouraging, this number skyrocketed to 96% after patients underwent repeat ablations. The study also recorded a striking decrease in the incidence of painful shocks from the patient's implantable cardioverter defibrillators. Before the ablation, they experienced an average of 1.1 shocks per month, and after the final ablation, they experienced an almost negligible 0.003 shocks per month. What stood out in the data was that the one thing that independently predicted a successful ablation was normalizing the epicardial electrocardiogram. To distill it down, this series of patients showcased how epicardial ablation can significantly reduce episodes of ventricular fibrillation. Experts weigh in stating that this innovative treatment should be extended to every patient who has Brugada syndrome and suffers from ventricular fibrillation. While the question remains if ablation can fully replace the use of the implantable cardioverter defibrillator, it should not yet be used as a substitute. Yet the promising results might indeed justify a randomized trial comparing the cardioverter defibrillator and ablation. I must say, I get excited when I hear about the kind of data detailed in that study, since advances like that can make a huge impact on a patient's quality of life. And now over to you, Peter. Thank you, Nora. All right, everyone, now I want to know if you've heard of MedMastery, and if not, I want to take a minute to tell you a bit about what we do. We offer internationally accredited CME courses via our digital education platform that's received multiple awards for outstanding digital education. We are highly commended by the British Medical Association and used by residency programs and universities around the world to train their clinicians and students. With a faculty that represents a wide range of clinical specialties, you can trust that you're learning from the best. Our faculty members practice, teach, and train at universities around the world. 21% of our paying members say that we've helped them save at least one life. And we'd love to help you do the same. We make it easy to try us out at no risk to you via our free trial. So what are you waiting for? Grab your free trial now and start learning today. And now I'll pass the mic to Nora for some concluding thoughts. Thanks so much, Peter. I hope everyone enjoyed today's episode and learned a lot. We're so glad you joined us and we hope to see you again next week. And before I go, if you've enjoyed this podcast and want more of the latest cardiology research from top cardiology journals, don't forget to subscribe.